tonight. Hopefully a few more will come on in. Before we get into any time to get started, we'll do so with prayer. Ask you to stand. Let's lift our hearts, our hands, our voices to heaven. Let's invite his presence into this house. Father, we love you. We're so thankful for the privilege that we have once again to come into your house, to worship, to magnify, to glorify your name. God, I've been feasting off the, the services from Sunday. God, I'm thankful for the ones that receive breakthroughs around here in these altars. God, I'm asking, Lord, for you to continue to move, touch and work, God, in a way that only you can. Father, I pray tonight that you'd speak to us through your word. Speak to us by your spirit. God, most of all, pour your spirit out upon us in these altars tonight. Do a work, oh God, that only you can do. We are a needy people, oh Lord, in need of a touch from you. God, we need a touch. God, in this dry and barren land where no water is, Lord, we long and we thirst for you. And I'm asking you that you'd have your will and your way in this house. From the opening prayer, oh God, to the closing, amen. We're going to love you, thank you, and praise you for it all in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's worship the Lord together tonight.
tonight to receive our Wednesday night tithes and offerings, and while they're coming, let me tell you how good it is to have everyone with us in the house of the Lord. We appreciate you and your faithfulness to be anywhere else on a Wednesday night doing anything else. You chose to be in the house of the Lord tonight. May God honor your faithfulness, amen, as he meets with us tonight in this place. As for the Daniel Rod, I'll be with her wherever you all send.
I can trust you tonight. Hallelujah. There's never been a test, never been a storm, never been a trial that he's not been there, that he's not kept us. Amen. We're kept by the word, by the power of God. Amen. I am so thankful for that. Amen. I do ask that you be in prayer tonight for uh, Sister Pettis, uh, Sister Meek's mom. Brother Meeks called me early this morning and uh, let me know that she had had a very bad night last night. Her, her heart rate had dropped into the 20s. Oxygen level tanked to the, the 70s and they thought that uh, you know, this, this might be it for her. And uh, they said somewhere about uh, sun up, her heart rate picked back up, oxygen picked back up. And uh, it's been kind of sporadic. Throughout the day, I was by there and, and prayed with him for uh, quite a while today. And uh, he messaged me just before church and said that her heart rate was beginning to drop again. So uh, she's 100 years old. She has lived a long, uh, long life. And uh, none of us are promised immortality on this side. Amen. I don't know what God's will. He can raise her off that bed and she could live. Amen. Outlive me. As long as there's breath, there's hope. But if this is God's time, I've been in prayer today that he would make our crossing and our home going easy. And uh, that the peace of, of God would cover Sister Meeks and Brother Meeks. And uh, I was praying for them today and uh, in their house. And the Holy Ghost fell down in that place. And uh, just you, you could feel God was there. And uh, I, I believe that that's what the, the writer said was precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of the saints. Even in the middle of, of, uh, of heartache and heartache and grief for those that are left to pick up the pieces after they're gone. I mean, if you can die with the peace of God and knowing that you can exhale on this side and inhale on the other side and be in the presence of the Lord, folks, that is a precious thing. It doesn't make grief and death any easier. For those that are left behind, but for those that know the Lord and those that are getting ready to meet him, I mean, that is a precious thing. So I ask that you keep them in your prayers. Brother James Mobley, as he uh, continues to battle sickness, as he is going through an intense round of, of chemo, uh, he doesn't have an appetite, just very nauseous. And um, you know, Sister Sheila called me last week and um, asked me to, to be in special prayer for him and we have been I was going to go by there a couple of times and visit with him but uh, he's just very sick doesn't want visitors doesn't want company and so I told him I said well when you get better I'll be there and uh, we'll visit with you but until then we're going to be intensely praying on our end and uh, I said the church is going to be praying so when you pray remember those two and also uh, Sister Becky has been texting us today Brother Jonathan as a co-worker, I believe his son is 11 years old. 
uh, but he sustained a brain injury and uh, had to have emergency surgery today. And uh, there were questions there about the level of brain activity and um, they were having all kinds of issues, but they said after the surgery, he was able to open his eyes and able to respond. So thank God for that. And I believe that he is gonna have to go undergo some additional surgeries. Um, but we believe that the Lord has kept him this far and the Lord's gonna continue to work and bring about healing in that body. I know there's a lot of other needs that we've been praying for, but Eddie Morris, need to continue to remember him, Sister Darlene Rada, and that the Lord would continue to touch these, uh, continue to pray for Brother Eddie as he is in, in the road uh, in Georgia, uh, preaching that camp meeting, uh, that the Lord would bless and the Lord would help there and uh, just give him traveling mercies on the road. If you have your Bibles tonight, I'm going to turn with us to the book of Acts, chapter number 20. I'm going to preach to you tonight, and on a out of a verse that I had never preached from, and it's kind of strange because it is my favorite verse in the entirety of Scripture. And if my life had a, a mission or a theme, and I, I had a, a central verse that I would want to define my life, it would be this verse right here uh, in Acts 20 and 24. But uh, I've I remember when I first got saved and, and the Lord was dealing with me and uh, began to feel the call to preach upon my life. I was on my bed one night reading this scripture. I was still in high school, but I was up very late that particular night and I was reading the scriptures. And I came across this verse and I remember just breaking down and weeping and crying. And I said, Lord, I said, that's what I want to be able to be said about my life. And uh, I've never preached from it before, but uh, I am tonight. I was uh, The Lord led me to these verses this morning. I couldn't get away from them. And began to talk to me late this afternoon. And just want to share right out from my heart tonight. Acts chapter 20, verse number 22, Paul is writing. And he said, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds... And afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. So that I may finish my course with joy. And the ministry. Which I have received of the Lord Jesus. To testify the gospel. Of the grace of God. There it is right there. If I had one verse. To sum up my life and my ministry. That would be the verse. I count not my life dear unto myself, but let me finish my course with joy and ministry, which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He went on to say in verse 25, And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own self shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which you're sanctified. If you'll skip down to verse 36 for the sake of time, it says, And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. They all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. And I, I want to preach with the Lord to help me for a few minutes on a simple thought of a dead man walking. Strange title, I know, but just bear with me for just a, a few minutes tonight, but uh, it'll all make sense. But a dead man walking. Father, I love you tonight. I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for the scripture of God that sustained me many a days and many a nights. Weary in this body, weary in 
spirituality, wearying on the journey, Lord, I, I've drawn strength of these verses right here. And God, it's my prayer that I may finish my course in the ministry that you have given unto me with joy. God, that I may testify the gospel of the grace of God. Father, I pray that you'd strengthen and encourage and edify the body tonight. That you'd help us, oh God, that you'd speak to us through your word. Let your anointing be present. We're going to give you thanks and glory for it all. In Jesus' holy name we pray it. And the church says amen. amen. And amen. The term dead man walking is one that you may be familiar with. We know that a prisoner that has been condemned to death by execution, he is sentenced unto that execution and under the United States, he has a right to appeal. And after that appeal date is set, he has an execution date from that. But from that time that the appeal is denied to the time of that execution, he is referred to as a dead man walking. Meaning he is, is going to happen. It is inevitable. He's going to die. He may have oxygen flowing through his body. He may have blood coursing through his veins. But he is a dead man walking. I'm not dealing with the physical aspect of death because that's a very morbid thought of that in the physical. But I do want to deal with the spiritual aspect of a dead man walking. Because in our text, Paul, he is visiting Ephesus for the final time. He would make his journey soon to the city of Jerusalem where he would be bound and sent to Rome where ultimately he would be executed. His life would be given for the cause of Christ. And the Bible tells us that as he was going to city, to city, to city, people would warn him, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. Stay here. You can minister here. You can build you a church. And what a church you can have. You, you planted uh, churches in the neighboring cities. The church of Ephesus was the first mega church, if you will, that at one point in time had over 10,000 people attending the services. Paul, you've been effective in ministry. Just, just hang out right here with us. Set up your ministry here. There, there's no need to go to Jerusalem. But Paul was called to go to Jerusalem. Paul, it was birthed in his heart to go and adventure, to be at Jerusalem for Passover. He had that desire in his heart, but God had another desire. God knew that uh, and already had his plan uh, mapped out that Paul was going to be apprehended in Jerusalem, that he was going to go from Jerusalem ultimately to Rome because the gospel was to be declared in Rome and Paul was to be the vessel that was to, to carry the gospel to Rome. He was the one that was chosen for this. So Paul had given up all rights to his life. He had given up everything for the cause of Christ. He no longer had a will. He no longer had uh, 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 any desire or ambitions outside of the will of God. Paul had crucified himself to the place that his will was to do the will of God. It wasn't about what made him happy. It wasn't about what brought him joy, but it was about what brought God joy. It was about what brought life and vitality to the kingdom of God. Paul truly was a dead man walking. He had given away all rights to his life. The ownership of his life had been turned over to another. It had been turned over to the Lord, Jesus Christ. And we look at the life of Paul. There was three things specifically that the Lord dealt with me about. This afternoon that I, I want to share with you quickly and briefly if the Lord will be my help. Uh, number one, there were three, uh, three areas of, uh, of Paul's life that he was dead to. But the first area is he was dead to sin. No amens, but he was. In Acts 20 verse 19, he greeted the church and he said that he was serving the Lord with all humility of mind. With many tears and temptations. Amen. You know, in, in today's world, men attempt, amen, to become masters of their craft, masters of their trade. We want to be the masters of our domain. But in all actuality, men are not masters, but men are always servants. Our life is, is servitude. 
In actuality, you can strive for mastery of many different things. But when the rubber meets the road, men, every man is a servant. You're either going to be a servant to one or two things. You're going to be a servant unto righteousness or a servant unto unrighteousness. You're going to be a servant unto holiness or a servant unto unholiness. You're going to be a servant in the kingdom of God or you're going to be a servant to the devil in the in the kingdom of darkness. Amen. There is no middle ground. That's what being born again is all about is leaving the clutches of unrighteousness and entering into the righteousness of God. And Paul made it very clear who his master was. He said, I'm serving the Lord with all humility in mind. To make such a claim and a statement, Paul had to be dead to a life of sin. Now, you look at the life of Paul in the Holy Scripture. He referred to himself as the chiefest of sinners. He was one that consented unto the death of Stephen. He was one that consented unto the death of, of many Christians and many people died because of the actions and the will of this man. Amen. He truly was a servant unto sin. But on the Damascus road, thank God, he changed owners. On the Damascus road, thank God, he became, uh, left the clutches of evil. Uh, amen. He departed from being the chiefest of sinners. Uh, and by God's grace, he became uh, one of the chiefest of saints. Uh, amen. Folks, that's what being born again is all about. Uh, amen. Living uh, the life of another. Living the life of Christ. Being dead to sin. Uh, amen. You say, can you truly die to sin? Uh, Paul wrote in Romans 6 verse 1, what? shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound God forbid how shall we that are dead to sin live therein any longer listen I'm up to here amen I've, I've heard people and it's growing more and more prevalent amen that everybody has to sin a little bit every day hogwash there's a church this side of Jerusalem that's a whole lot closer to us than it is away from it, but I'll leave it at that. I've driven by the past couple of days having to go do things and run errands, and the, the, their slogan that is on their church sign is, Only sinners worship here. I thought to myself, how stupid is that? Only sinners. I, I know we're in a competition Amen, they're in competition trying to come up with the catchiest slogan, uh, amen, of what can be on the, the most cutting edge. But listen, folks, uh, amen, I am not a sinner. Sinners don't come to church to worship. Saved people come to church to worship. Sinners come to church to be saved. Saved people come to church to worship. Amen. That, uh, uh, that, that mentality, uh, we're just sinners saved by grace. Uh, amen. I know it may be catchy, but folks, I'm not a sinner. That's who I was. Uh, amen. And that's what being born again is all about. Uh, dying to sin. Uh, dying to that lifestyle. Dying to what I was. Uh, amen. Thank God I've been saved this year. Makes 20 years. Uh, I'm not the same man that I was 20 years ago. Amen. Amen. The sin that gripped my life I don't grip my life anymore. The chains of bondage and addiction that grip my life, I, it doesn't grip my life anymore. I, amen. I've been set free to that. I am dead to that. I, listen, folks, you're, you're looking at a man. You see a preacher in a suit and tie tonight. I, I mean, you uh, rewind 20 years ago, you're going to see a young teenager strung out uh, on drugs, strung out uh, on alcohol, bound by addiction, uh, bound by the things uh, of this this world looking for hope and looking for help uh, in all different facets of this world but only being uh, hung out and uh, hung over and left out to dry. Uh, amen. I was a sinner but when I was born again folks uh, I died to that. 
I died to that. I no longer have the same addictions. I no longer have the same cravings. I remember craving drugs. I remember craving alcohol. Now, I crave the presence of the Lord. Now, amen, I still have addictions in my life, but it's not the same one. I'm not addicted to things of this world, folks. I'm addicted to Him. Hallelujah. I'm addicted to His Spirit. I'm addicted, amen, as the house of Stephanus in the book of Acts. They said that they have addicted themselves unto the ministry, folks. Amen. I'm, a, I'm, I'm preaching to you tonight. Paul was dead to sin. It is the will of God for you to die out to sin. Now, are you preaching sinless perfection, preacher? Amen. I'm not. Amen. Every one of us from the time we're born again uh, until the time we die, uh, we have the capability to fall back into sin. There's not a single person that's perfect. Uh, there's only been one perfect man that's walked the earth, uh, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, amen. But outside of that, uh, we're imperfect, uh, amen, uh, uh, creatures that have the capability to sin. Uh, I can walk away from the Lord. Uh, I can walk away from ministry. I can walk away from my salvation today. Uh, amen. Uh, and I'm not preaching one saved, always saved. Not preaching eternal security. I'm not preaching, uh, amen, uh, unconditional election. Uh, amen. Preaching none of those things. Every one of us has uh, the capability uh, to fall back into sin. But if a man is truly born again, uh, amen, he is going to uh, die to that, uh, that bondage and that craving for sin. Does he have the capability to fall into sin? Yes. Will he fall ignorantly into uh, sin at some point in time in the future? More than likely. But his will and what drives him is not going to be that same life of sin that it has always been. Amen. That chained him. That's why the scripture says, if a man fall, we have an advocate with the Father, which is Christ Jesus the Lord. If, amen, if that word is what it means, amen, it's not a guarantee, amen, but if you fall, you have an advocate with the Father, which is Christ Jesus the Lord. Amen, the wheels of my life have changed. The wheels in Paul's life is changed. Hallelujah. Thank God. Amen. That he lived his life dead unto sin. That habitual, that willful sin was out of his life and no longer a power player. And Paul was not a prisoner of sin. Hallelujah. But he was a partaker of grace. Amen. He said, I am dead to sin. Amen. That old carnal lifestyle. Amen. It's a, it, it, it's, it's uh, passed away. Uh, all things have passed away. Behold, uh, all things have become new. He lived his life uh, dead unto sin. And I can tell you, folks, it is God's will for his church to live dead unto sin, to be a dead man walking. For those cravings of the flesh that have gripped our lives, for years and years, for them to die, to dry up, to waste away, and to ruin. When Paul found himself out of Satan's grasp, he found himself safely in God's grace. He said in Romans 5 and 20, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where grace abounded, excuse me, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. I mean, you want to know one of the largest detriments to the church in the 21st century? I'm afraid that much of the church no longer views sin as God views sin. Amen. Amen. We no longer view sin as God views sin. You see, in God's eyes, sin is repulsive. Sin is abhorrent. Think of all the worst adjectives and adverbs in the world you could use to describe to something. That's how God views sin. But yet many can view things, watch things, partake of things, know what's wrong. They just overlook it. Don't really care. They think that they're above it. Amen, folks, we need to go back to looking at sin the way God sees sin. 
We need to separate ourselves from that. To rise above that. Can't do it in our own strength, but we can do it by the power of the Spirit. John Wesley said this, Give me a hundred men who ain't nothing but sin and love God with all their hearts, and I'll shake the world for Christ. Oh, that there would be a hundred such men in this generation that would love nothing but God and hate nothing but sin. Hallelujah. We can see revival. Hallelujah. We could see souls birthed into the kingdom of God. We could see the miraculous take place. Amen. But it's going to start with a commitment and a dedication. It's going to start with the effort. Amen. Of being dead to sin. Paul was the, one of the greatest men to ever wear shoe leather. We preached about it Sunday night. Author 13 to 14 books of the Bible. Possibly wrote Hebrews the 14th. Amen. But all of this, the, the miraculous things that he did, it all started with one thing that was death to sin amen by the blood of Jesus Christ amen what's the key to miraculous it's the blood folks it's starting right there amen being born again on the journey hallelujah Paul was dead to sin amen and if we are dead to sin folks then we are going to be alive unto Christ amen what, what is uh, opposite there is true to be uh, alive in sin is to be dead in Christ. But to be alive in Christ is to be dead in sin. Hallelujah. Amen. Dead to sin. Amen. Paul was there. Not only was he dead to sin. Amen. But Paul was also dead to self. Once he was born again, once he was filled with the Spirit, I, I quoted it to you Sunday night. Amen. But Paul didn't go where Paul wanted to go. Paul went where the Spirit led him to go. Paul went uh, where God opened the doors. We saw this in Acts chapter 16. We preached about it Sunday night. They had gone throughout Persia to the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. When they were come to Mysia, they asserted to go into Bithia, but the Spirit suffered them not. They passed by Mysia, came down to Troas, uh, and a vision appeared unto Paul in the night. There stood him a man of Macedonia praying, saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. If Paul had his rathers, he would have been in Bithynia. If Paul would have had his rathers, he would have gone unto Asia. But God said, you ain't going to Asia. You ain't going to Bithynia. I'm sending you down, hallelujah, to Macedonia to preach the gospel. Amen. Paul had come to the realization in his life uh, that he wasn't calling the shots. Uh, he was dead to self. Uh, he was dead to what he wanted. He was dead to his ambitions. His life uh, had been given over to another purpose. Uh, his life was surrendered uh, to the absolute and perfect will of God. Amen. We see this play out in our text. He said, and now I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem. Not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city. Saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. I don't know what's going to happen when I get to Jerusalem. But everywhere I go there's a prophet. Standing up saying Paul you're going to be afflicted. You're going to be bound. Two things is going to happen. Bonds and afflictions. Bonds and afflictions bonds and afflictions every city I go in that's all I get can I tell you if that were Corey Brown and everybody standing up prophesying to me bonds and afflictions bond and afflictions bond and I, I think I might say time out Let, let's see this thing through Lord I'm not I'm not cut out for prison I don't want to go to jail. I don't like bonds. I don't want to. I don't want to do that. Paul could have said, "Time out, Lord. I've already been to prison, and I don't like it. I've already been in stocks and fetters. You delivered me one time. Why is it that I want to? You're leading me back to go into to prison again. Everywhere bonds and afflictions. But after that." I like what the Amplified said of our text. He said, I don't know what's going to happen to me in Jerusalem. But I don't consider my life as something of value or dear to me. 
My life is not my own. I've been bought with a price. Hallelujah. I've been bought by another. I'm his servant. And I consider my life not as valuable nor dear. So that I may with joy finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify faithfully of the good news of God's precious undeserved grace uh, which makes us free of the guilt and sin and grants us uh, eternal life. Uh, I can tell you folks that mentality cuts against the grain uh, of all human nature. Amen. All of human nature. We want to better ourselves. We want to try to market ourselves and make ourselves better and make ourselves more valuable so that we can enjoy life more. We want to work harder, get more overtime, get more money so that we can just enjoy things and live life a little bit better so that our life in some eyes could be a little bit more valuable. But Paul said, I'm not about keeping up with the Joneses. This is not a competition. I consider my life nothing of the Tell you, my life is not dear unto me. My life is not my own, folks. That mentality goes against the grain of all modern thinking, of all modern philosophies. Amen. He truly lived out his life with the mission to live is to die, to die. Amen. Is to gain. Hallelujah. To live as Christ and to die is to gain. Amen. He truly was a remarkable, a remarkable man with a remarkable uh, mission centered around his life. Uh, my life is not valuable or dear unto me. My life uh, belongs unto him. Amen. Amen. While cutting against the grain, I want you to notice what Paul said in 2 Timothy verse 3. That in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. That's what it says. The very first thing that marks perilous times is that men will love themselves more than they love God. Just look at this generation, folks. You only live once. Live life to the fullest. It's all about the now. We're seeing a generation that loves themselves more than that of the antithesis of what Paul was. Paul was dead to self, but he said that in the last generations, men are going to embrace themselves. They're going to be covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affliction, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, trading, heady, high-minded. Here it is, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God having a form of denying the godliness, denying the power thereof from such turn away. He's writing unto Timothy. He said, this is going to be the mark of the last days. And there's some terrible things that are mentioned here. They're going to be unholy, without natural affection. There's going to be marked homosexuality in that day. They're going to be liars, false accusers. I could go on and on out of all this, but you want to know what sums it all up? Out of these, all the horrendous things that are, are, are mentioned, it all flows out of the first thing, and that is men shall be lovers of them own selves. They're going to love them. They're going to want to do what they want to do. They're going to have no regard for anything holy. They're going to be lovers of pleasures more than, than, than lovers of God. He went on to say in Philippians 3, uh, verse 18, for many walk of whom I have told you often and I tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction. Here it is. Whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Uh, amen. It says there an interesting phrase, whose God is uh, their belly. Now, uh, uh, you, this could be taken as that of, of gluttons that love them own selves, that love... That, that, that overeat, that become uh, uh, partakers of that, but it's a deeper spiritual connotation there than that. Uh, because in biblical days, uh, I've shared this many times, but it's worth repeating for the sake of this verse. The, the, the belly was considered the, sin, or the, the, the center of one's emotions. And the same way that we would say, I love you with all of my heart, in today's terms, that would be, uh, saying that I love you with every seat of emotion. In our culture, the heart is the center point. But in their days, the belly 
was the center point. So men, you want to be real romantic to that wife tonight? <laughs> Honey, I love you with all my bowels. It don't carry the same punch for us when we say it. But that was what they would say in biblical days. My bowels yearn for you. That, that's, that's even mentioned, uh, amen, in, in Scripture. Uh, amen, talking about the bowels. If, if you see your brother in need and, and have not uh, uh, bowels of compassion, have been how dwells uh, the love of God within you. Uh, bowels represent the center point of emotion. Uh, so what uh, Paul was saying here is that their God is going to be their belly. Uh, their God is going to be themselves. Uh, amen, their, their God is not going to be Jehovah. They're not going to regard uh, God as God, but they're going to, float themselves up as God. Is it any wonder why in the charismatic realm of the church today amen there's mega time hot shot preachers that are elevating themselves as little gods. Saying we're little gods. We have our own dominions. We have our own kingdoms. Uh, we have our own authority. I can tell you folks uh, that's heretical uh, and that is dangerous, dangerous grounds. Uh, we're seeing it even slip into the church uh, that men are becoming their own God. Uh, amen. Their God shall be uh, their bellies. Uh, but Paul said, uh, amen, he had to move beyond himself uh, as others could. He said, uh, amen, it's not about me. It's not about myself. Uh, but God is all about you. Uh, Amen. I'm not my own God. I've been bought with the price. I'm dead to sin and I'm dead to self. It's not about where I want to go. It's where you want me to go. It's not what I want to preach. It's what you want me to preach. It's not what I want to do, God. It's what you want me to do. I'm dead to everything but you, my God. The same way it's imperative in the life of every individual that we be dead to sin. It it is imperative, uh, amen, and mandatory in the life of the believer uh, that we be dead to self, uh, that we give all rights unto God. Uh, he's purchased us. Uh, he's redeemed us. Uh, we are His. Uh, it's not about what we want to do. Uh, it's about what He wants to do in us, uh, through us, uh, and out of us, my God, uh, that we can make Him known in this world. Paul moved beyond themselves as others couldn't. But it is imperative for us. That's why he said, I am crucified with Christ. And nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me, gave himself for me. He said in Philippians 3 and verse 20, following up there, that verse, whose God is their belly, he said, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working thereby, whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Amen. Paul truly was one that was dead to sin. He was dead to self. Man, I shared with you in the formative, literally days of my Christian experience and walk with God. I'd gotten saved a week before, filled with the Holy Ghost. I came straight home from church camp. The next week, two-a-day football practice. My whole life, I'd eaten sports, drank sports. I played Baseball from the time I was knee high all the way up. Football. Loved it. Passionate about sports. That Monday morning, I'm getting up to go to two-day football practice. And the Lord spoke to me so plainly and clearly and said, lay it down. Now for me, you might as well have shot me at that point in time. Because that was something I just was not prepared to deal with or do. That's what I wanted. That's what I wanted to, to pursue, to be. I loved it. I loved playing the game. Went on to practice. Practice Monday. Monday evening. Came home, went to bed. 
Tuesday morning, practice rolls around, get up. God speaks to my heart, lay it down. God, I, I don't want to do this. I want to play. Went on to practice that Tuesday morning. Come home. I'm fine. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, it hits me. Started having all kind of health problems, dizzy spells going on. Blood pressure was through the roof. My dad had just died the year before. And so I was panicking. My mom was panicking. She throws me in the car, go to the hospital. Blood pressure absolutely through the roof. Doctors couldn't find out what was wrong. But I'll never forget, I was hooked up to all these kind of monitors, EKG, all this kind of stuff going on. And the Lord spoke to my heart just as plainly as he did the night it saved me. I was laying in that bed. God spoke to my heart and said, it sure would have been a lot easier if you had done things my way. Sure would have been a lot easier if you had done things my way. I want you to lay it down. Told the coaches, I said, I'm done. Can't play anymore. I don't know why. To this day, I don't know why. I still love the game. Love everything about the game. Maybe God was protecting me from something. I don't know. Maybe it was a spinal cord injury. Maybe it was some injury that would have been altered in my life. I don't know what it was. But I do know that early on in my Christian walk, I had to realize that God had another will and another plan. And that my will ain't always his will. But his will is more important. His will is more important. I look back since that time, and while I love football and while I love baseball, I can tell you folks, I love the will and the call of God so much more. Hallelujah. I love him so much more. I couldn't care less. Amen. If I or my boy or my girl ever picks up a ball, ever does anything, if they want to, that's on them. But if they don't, it's not going to affect me a bit. Amen. Because I can tell you I love him a whole lot more than I love that. Listen, there's going to be things in your life at some point the Holy Ghost is going to put his finger on it. It might not be baseball and football for you. It might be Facebook. Oh, you're going to meddling now. It might be Pinterest. It might be Instagram. It might be television. It might be whatever it may be. I don't know, but God said, you love that more than you love me. Got to go. Are we really willing to die to self so that we can live unto God? You see, as we dealt with Paul, he died out to sin. He was alive unto salvation. Paul died out to self. But folks, I don't know if there's ever been a man outside of Christ that's been more alive in the spirit. You see, when you die out, when everything that you lay down, God gives you something better in exchange. Amen. Everything that you sacrifice and you crucify yourself to, I mean, there's a blessing on the other side of that. Amen, that God reveals himself or gives you truth. Amen, and I can tell you folks that the spirit is better than self any day of the week. On, Hallelujah. Amen. Paul was dead to that life. He was dead to, to self. But folks, he was alive in the spirit. He preached. My God, and the dead come back to life. He laid hands on the sick and he saw them recovered. Amen. There's been very few men, amen, that turned their world upside down for Christ. But Paul was one of them. Why was it? He was willing to be a dead man walking. He was willing to surrender all rights to the cause of Christ. Christ had absolutely all rights. If to every detail of his life and because of that amen the measure of the spirit that he received amen was great amen upon him what would happen today if men would take such ambition and drive to be just like that to give God unreserved rights to that life dead to sin dead to self so that they can be alive in the salvation and alive in the spirit of God not only was he dead to self, he was also dead to suffering. You, you see progressive work here, folks. Every man, every born-again man has a point of down where he's got to die out to sin. Through the work of sanctification, you're going to find out, amen, you're, you're going to, to see and to experience that self has to die, flesh has to die. 
so that the spirit may live. But then we get down to the point of suffering. And this is something that impacts every single believer. I don't care whether you've been saved five minutes or whether you've been saved 55 years. There are times that you are going to suffer for the cause of Christ. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That is an emphatic statement that is just as much true as John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We love quoting that verse, but when it gets down to human suffering and what we call suffering in America, <laughs> we suffer very little for the cause of Christ. They're chopping their heads off on the Ivory Coast right now in Africa. In Sudan, in Nigeria, they're burning them in cages. They're bulldozing churches and running over them with excavators. Brutal, horrendous ways to go out. And yet we want to get upset because somebody don't like our Facebook post. Or somebody puts a crying emoji. Or somebody don't like what we... God help us. But I can tell you folks, it's going to get worse. I'm not rejoicing in that. I'm not looking for it. But amen. Every one of us, we, we may not be putting our head on a chopping block today, but all of us, we're going to suffer persecution. We're going to have to deal with human suffering. I mean, the Bible says that Peter said, I would rather you suffer as a believer than as an evildoer. Evildoers have to suffer because of what they do when they're in sin. Amen. A Christian suffers because of oftentimes because of who they are, a child of God. Paul was warned many times that suffering was going to come his way. But I want you to realize something, folks. He was dead to that. He truly was a dead man walking. Everywhere he goes, people are prophesying bonds and afflictions. Bonds and afflictions. But he said, none of these things move me. None of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself that I may finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He was saying, folks, I'm dead to sin, I'm dead to self, and I'm dead to sufferings. Now, if there was, it's one thing to say that, but it's something altogether different to live that. It's one thing to say I'm dead to sufferings for the cause of Christ. When you haven't suffered anything. It's one thing to say persecutions don't bother me when you've never really been persecuted. But you can go through 2 Corinthians 11 and just read of the sufferings of Paul. He said, let me tell you what I've been. Not that I'm going to glory after the flesh, but I'm going to glory unto God. He said, I speak as a reproach. He says, uh, of all the things, he said, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I'm more, and labor is more abundant, and stripes above measure, and prisons more frequent, and deaths off. Of the Jews, five times received, I forty stripes saved one. I've preached that to death. Uh, the reason that they gave them forty stripes saved one or thirty-nine is the first time uh, that a man was beaten uh, in Jerusalem during that time frame by the Romans. He was beaten forty times and fell over dead. Uh, so they said that you, if you're going to beat a man, you can't beat him forty times because forty times uh, has killed one man and may kill this one. Uh, so we don't want to kill them. We want to get them, but we do want to get them just as close as possible to death without crossing the line. So he said, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Five times he was brought right to the brink of death by beating. He said, thrice I was beat with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered a shipwreck at night of the day. I've been in the deep and journeys often in perils of waters and perils of robbers and perils of my own countrymen and perils of the heathen and perils of the city and perils of the wilderness and perils of the sea. And perils among false brethren, and weariness, and painfulness, and watchings often, and hunger, and thirst, and fastings often, in cold and in nakedness. Beside all of these things that are without, amen, I have to deal daily with the care of the churches. He went on to say that he was kept when the governor of Damascus wanted to apprehend him, and through a basket was let down by the wall. And escaped his hands. Folks, any of these sufferings would be enough to make a lukewarm pew warmer. 
Say, I'm done. I'm out. I quit. I told you. I'm not, a, I'm not an SSP tonight, a super spiritual person. I don't have wings and a halo. I don't like to suffer. I don't like persecutions. I think I might would be able to, having to find me a place to pray and say, Lord, you sure about this? You see, if, if, if a man were to endure all of this and seek out Christian counsel in today's time, most of them would say, you're out of the will of God. If you were in the will of God, all of these things wouldn't happen to you. But Paul was in the perfect will of God. And all of these things were happening to him. Amen. All of these sufferings were enough to make many want to quit. But he said in 2 Corinthians 11, 30, If I must glory, I will glory in the things which, confer, which concern my infirmities. He said throughout all of the sufferings, I glory in that. Amen. My suffering brings God's glories. Amen. It got him to the point where he said, I don't fear what man can do unto me. I don't care what man is going to do. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to be holy. I'm going to live righteously. I'm going to live soberly in this world. You may not like me. Hallelujah. You may scold me. You may beat me. You may cut me. Amen. You may leave me for dead, but I'm going to love you through it all, and I'm going to preach to you Christ and Him crucified. I'm going to preach heaven real, hell hot and holiness is hard as I can. Hallelujah. He said, I'm dead to your thoughts. I'm dead to your opinions. I'm dead to what you think about me. But I am very much alive under Christ. He was a dead man walking. Dead unto sin. Dead unto hallelujah. Uh, forgot the second point. Amen. To himself. And he was dead unto the thoughts of suffering that men had come against him with Amen. he went on to say curse to come help me I'm done he said for which cause we faint not but though the outward man perish yet the inward man is renewed day by day for our light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding weight of eternal glory amen the things that we suffer is but light and is but for a moment and it worketh in us a far more exceeding weight of eternal glory. He went on to say in Romans 8 and 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. All of my sufferings, all of this, all of 2 Corinthians 11, all those things which he endured, he said all of those things, all those sufferings, all those afflictions, cannot be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Amen, folks. He was dead to all of that. Amen. Paul was dead to sufferings because he was dedicated unto service. He was faithful unto service. He knew what was going to fall in, in Jerusalem. But he said, man, I want you to take record this day that I'm free from the blood of all men. I might not be free from sufferings, but I'm free from the blood of the men that I've encountered because I have not shunned to declare to you all the counsel of God. Paul was a man that was compelled more by service than his sufferings. I can tell you, folks, when you serve, you will suffer. A lot of people, I want to be in ministry. I want to do ministry. When in actuality, they want the glamorous aspects of ministry. They don't want all the grunt work that goes into ministry. That's why the scripture says you never put a novice into an office. Don't put anybody that's not battle tested in a place of authority or position because you don't know how they're going to respond in that battle. Because I can promise you when you serve, you're going to suffer. If you run a church that has more than two people, there's going to be a point in time where they ain't going to agree with everything you have to say and everything that you do. I'm reminded of the man that was on the desert island, deserted island, in the middle of the ocean. He was out there for 20 years. Only him on that island. Finally, after 20 years, a ship comes by and rescues him. And he welcomes them onto the island. He said, why don't you come look in the place where I've been the last 20 years? 
He said, I want you to look at these three buildings. He said, this is my house. This is where I live. He said, this second building. He said, this is my church. This is where I worship. And he said, come on over here. He said, let me show you the other side of the island. And the captain said, hold up, wait a minute. What's the third building? He said, oh, that's the other church. We had a split. He was on an island with one. You have different people. Not everybody's going to like what you say. Not everybody's going to like what you do. Those that serve, amen, are going to suffer from time to time. But I can tell you in ministry, your heart of service must be greater than the feelings of sufferings. The heart of servitude and the heart of love. I can tell you, I'm not putting ministry in a, a, a dark light because I can tell you there's absolutely nothing greater than living the life in the ministry for the King. Hallelujah. There's nothing more glorious. Amen. Nothing better. But I can tell you, if you're going to make it, you're going to have to be dead. Amen to that feeling. That's tough. That's hard. But that's the key to victory. I'm reminded, and I'm closing with this, to young Germans. They heard about an island in the West Indies that had about two to 3,000 African slaves. On that island was a British plantation owner that was bitter against the Lord. And he gave word to these African slaves. He said, you're going to come work the plantation. He said, but there's no Christianity here. There'll never be Jesus preached here. He said, I've done that and I'm beyond that. Those thousands of slaves went to this island worked there for a number of years the story somehow came back to these two German Moravian missionaries who heard about it heard about all the thousands of slaves that were there no gospel no church no discipleship so they began to inquire what must I do to get onto the island there was only one way that they could get onto that island and that was for themselves to become slaves. They sold themselves into servitude so that they could get onto the island with slaves where they could present the gospel of Jesus to them. When they were headed down to the dock to get on the ship, their family were crying, their church people were gathered in tears. Their mama knew she'd never see that baby again. That daddy knew he would never be able to see his son again. They boarded that ship. Their faces like a flint to the mission that was ahead. Right before they was out of sound waves, they turned back to the crowd and they uttered these words. May the Lamb of God that was slain receive the reward of his sufferings. May the Lamb of God that was slain receive the reward of his sufferings. And with that, the Moravian missions were birthed. That's a very famous story made very popular by one Paris Reedhead who told that back in the uh, earlier years of the, the, the church. But here's the rest of the story. What isn't written in a lot of history books. Those two young boys went to that island and after a very short stint they contracted malaria and died with no spiritual fruit somehow some way word got back to that same church about those two missionaries that they loved that they had tragically died malaria buried on that island no spiritual fruit They wept, they cried, they mourned. But God began dealing with a few other young people that were dead to sin and became dead to self. And guess what they did? They sold themselves as slaves 
to that same plantation. They went down there and began preaching Christ. This time, conviction gripped the heart of that plantation owner. He said, there's got to be something to this Jesus. Amen. That these people knew that their best friend, their family members had died. Yet when they died and they were buried, they come to replace them in preaching the gospel. He got saved. They planted a church. And that entire population of African slaves were born again. Hallelujah. May the Lamb of God that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. Hallelujah. Amen, folks. God wants us to be dead to sin. He wants us to be dead to self. He wants us to be dead to the light afflictions of suffering that we endure so that he might receive the reward of his sufferings. Because I can promise you his sufferings on the cross were far greater than any light affliction that we bear down here. Hallelujah. Amen. I know it's a simple message tonight, but I pray that our hearts would be stirred and challenged by the Word of God. Maybe you're here, you are in sin. Maybe you're hearing that old man is still alive. Maybe you're watching my way of live stream. I can tell you today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time of the Lord. Hallelujah. You can die to that sin, you can die to that problem. Maybe see it isn't your problem. Maybe you're born again, but self is creeping up. Amen. Maybe it's crucifying self, flesh. Maybe it's that the, the aspect of what you see in the mirror every morning that's causing you the problems. And Paul said, I'm dead to that. And maybe it's ministry. Maybe it's suffering. Amen. That you're enduring, not as an evildoer, but as a, as a Christian, as a believer. Amen. Maybe it's things that you're facing that you just think ain't right. You shouldn't be having to deal with. And it's causing doubt. It's causing pain. It's causing anguish and turmoil. There's got to be a point in time when we deal with doubt and all of that. It calls of Christ. We, get, we go beyond ourselves. Amen. We get to the end of our rope. We hold on to Him. And allow Him to live in us and through us. In this world. Amen. Could you find us a place to pray around this altar tonight? Hallelujah. I don't know where you may be. I don't know what you may be facing, what you may be going through. Amen. But I can tell you there's power in death over sin. There's power in death over self. There's power. Amen. When we obtain death over our sufferings. Amen. And we let this life, the life of another, be lived in us and through us. Amen. Let's pray together.